The Tom Woods Show, episode 1497. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're like me, one of the most demoralizing things is when someone utters the truth and then lamely apologizes. Well, not these folks. I've got a free ebook of stories from heroic professors who told the PC mob to go pound sand. Stories from Jordan Peterson, Michael Rechtenwald, and others. Check it out at againstthemob.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. So glad to be joined once again by Michael Rechtenwald, retired from NYU. He's the author of nine books, including most recently on the verge of publication and perhaps indeed published by the time you hear this, Google Archipelago, The Digital Gulag and the Simulation of Freedom. Some of my listeners' favorite episodes have been the ones with uh, Professor Rechtenwald, who will tell you he was a lifelong Marxist, and it's very, very rare for somebody to make an ideological transformation uh, later in his career, but that's exactly what he's done. And our people have welcomed him with open arms, but uh, he needs to be on the level of a Jordan Peterson, if you ask me. And I, I'm sure you'll agree after this conversation. Uh, Michael, first of all, welcome back. Uh, glad to be talking to you again. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, my pleasure. Can we at least first get out of the way the title of the book? Uh, you say at the beginning that you did wrestle a bit with this because of the, the obvious reference to Solzhenitsyn. So what were you driving at with Google Archipelago? Yeah, I mean, the title is about the, it's a comparison, of course. It's a, a sort of analogous to the Gulag archipelago of, of Solzhenitsyn. And that is to say, it's a, you know, that was a vast prison system, but obviously it was a, a penal colony, a series of them. Whereas this is, a, what I'm talking about with Google is a digital gulagging, if you will. I'm basically talking about the transformation of the means of punishment and incarceration as the digital realm has developed. So the book is a lot more than about bias. And although I do deal with that bias and uh, all the um, slanted algorithms and unfair treatment of uh, anybody to the right of Stalin and so on and so forth. But uh, those are all, everything like that is definitely discussed in detail. And I get into quite a bit of detail in the book on these things, but the big picture is the Google Archipelago, this idea that what we're getting is a sort of digital incarceration, if you will, a sort of open air prison system with the adoption of smart cities, which are on their way to the West, already op- operative in 50 Chinese cities uh, and one or two Western cities. Uh, Australia has one in, in Darwin, Australia, of all places. What are these like? Uh, What they are is uh, they have CCTVs everywhere, all kind of data collection methods, you know, cameras all over the place. Uh, Basically, everybody is traced, tracked cameras and uh, uh, mechanisms like license plates are going to be a very big one, too, uh, so that every every move you make is digitally recorded and collated and collected and then sent to the proper agencies. For example, in China, they have things called digital fences. So it's that a citizen can't travel outside of that perimeter if they have been banned from that side of travel. Uh, and they use the social credit score as a means uh, to evaluate the subject's viability in terms of their how far they can go, where they can go, what can they even do, what can they purchase, can they own real estate, can they send their child to private school. This is, I'm calling AI with Chinese characteristics, which is a mockery of the Chinese Communist Party's notion that they are actually in their advance of capitalism, that they're actually trying to get to socialism through advanced capitalism. And that is going to compete with the Google-led AI on the Western side. So these, depending on which AI systems are most readily adopted in the U.S. and the rest of the West, we'll either have AI with Chinese characteristics or we'll be living in a Google archipelago. And either way, it's not good because both are leftist and both are authoritarians. This is the key, that they're left authoritarians and um, they have similar objectives. Uh, they want to have a wo- one world government, which has always been communism stream. They want to get rid of national boundaries. They want to get rid of the family. They want to get rid of the national state, but they want a one, they want a state. Believe me, they want a world state. 
So this is going to be a very interesting set of circumstances that develop as AI is rolled out across the West into these smart cities. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll just say that for a long time, I was worried about the one world government thing. But then I realized there's no way the Chinese are going to give up sovereignty to some world government. There's no way the Indians are going to do that. There's no way the U.S. is going to do that. The only one world government I think is really plausible is the U.S. acting as the world government. So I think that is not high on my priority list of, of concerns. Am I wrong? Um. I'm not saying that that's going to happen. I'm just telling you what the act, what their I mean, motivations are. Yeah, how how they how ideologically where they're coming from. I'm not predicting a one world government on the on the immediate horizon here. What I'm saying is that this is their ideological propensity. They are one world. Is, but that's that's not really the main thing. I mean, the main thing is this: these are these are authoritarians all through and through. You can see the way they're treating different contingents that have different political persuasion than they do. They are, you know, depersoning them or unpersoning them. They're restricting their travel based on their social media. I mean, this is getting uh, pretty severe. So my argument in the book also is that Google is a state apparatus, and most of the Google archipelago is a state apparatus. That is, they are actually wielded by the state and augmenting the state's power to a great degree. All right. Well, that I don't really question. The, the, I guess the question becomes, what do we do about this? Because I will get a lot of people saying, well, these are private companies and they can do whatever they want and so on and so forth. Then I get some people saying they're not really private. They're only partly private. I get okay. other people saying they're not uh, observing their own terms and conditions because Facebook never said you can't do X and Y, and yet it's kicking people off for doing X and Y. So there are various ways of looking at it. What's the way you look at it in terms of an action step for people? Well, I think the second group is correct. That is, it is partly a state apparatus because they were funded by the state to begin with. You know, I mean, CIA really developed Google funding-wise. So my idea is that we have to, de- the point is to make it clear and to clearly mark them as state apparatuses, as state functionaries. Therefore, on their platforms and in their searches and everywhere else that they are operating, they have to be seen as statists, and therefore, you know, not the rights of the, that is, that adhere to uh, citizens in those states should be observed on their platforms. Now, I I know your book goes well beyond the obvious issue of bias and this and that, but yet, yeah. I just can't help mentioning a couple of examples that jumped out at me because I follow this fairly closely, and somehow there were some things I missed that are pretty fundamental. Like that whole controversy about when a bunch of journalists, you know, obviously journalism's a rough occupation to be in these days. Yeah. And they're getting laid off like crazy. And so the fashionable thing was to say, learn to code to them. Uh, You know, like go find a useful thing to do with your life instead of thinking that we're going to pay you for your observations about the world. But you pointed out what I completely missed, which is that Learn to Code didn't start with heartless right-wingers who didn't care about poor, suffering journalists. Right. Uh, it was th- Those were just the ones who got punished for saying it. That's right. Learn to Code was uh, first directed at uh, Trump supporters who lost their jobs, and it was directed at them by journalists. So this was just payback whenever the journalists were losing their jobs and the Trump supporters were saying, learn to code. Yeah, and so the Trump supporters were getting banned. Yeah, they were the ones who were banned, and the journalists were never banned for doing it. I mean, so if people are doing the exact same thing, and one of them gets, one of them is the instigator of it, gets, you know, probably gets their Twitter account verified, and the other gets thrown off. That's basically what's happening. Uh, that's a very, that's a very, yes, yeah, very good example of the differential treatment. I mean, the differential treatment of anybody, like I said, left of uh, Stalin is just unbelievable. It's interesting, but it's sometimes it's also, like in the case of Julian Assange, now that's an interesting case because it's not really clear where he would rest along the political spectrum. Yeah, I mean, he's, right. I'm sure he thinks of himself as being on the left, but yet somehow there's something about him they don't like. Right. He's uh, He tells state secrets. That's the problem. And uh, he's right about them. That's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> so Assange has knowledge that they don't want out there and – You know, he hacked to get it. I mean, I'm not going to talk about hacking too much, but he is definitely a threat. So 
you know, it doesn't matter. I don't know where he lies on. I'd say he's a libertarian. I don't know if he's libertarian left or libertarian right. I think it doesn't matter in his case. He's not really dealing in the economic realm. He's dealing in the civil liberties realm. Right, right. And you would think by now, if he didn't have a cynical view of the state before, after what's happened to him, you would think he would have he would have gotten one uh, oh, pretty darn could. fast. He better have one by now. I think yeah. he probably is anti-statist in general. But you know, it's it's not just by the way the uh, you know what what Google and the big companies are up to. Uh, working synergistically with that is this this digital mob mentality. Oh yes. Absolutely. Of piling on people. You know, we right. found something from 38 years ago and we're going to – And whereas, by the way, I could find something from John McCain from, from two years ago when, you know, when he was walking the earth and no one would care because even though his thing actually resulted in deaths – Nobody cares about that. I mean, nobody cares about that. He'll still be on Meet the Press. He'll still be a respected elder statesman. Does not matter what the warfare state does. It genuinely doesn't, and it right. hasn't since Vietnam. Absolutely nobody cares. Right. But you you don't believe in whatever the latest leftist thing is. You're that, dead. You know, 15 minutes ago, they handed down the decree that we're all supposed to think this way. Then they want to destroy you. That's right. I mean, I call this digital Maoism because of the way they collectivize people, you know, using hashtags. It's very... It's very Maoist, Maoist in orientation because Mao, you know, mobilized these red cards to attack people that were ideologically impure or wrong, you know, unwoke, as it were, in our cases, and then, you know, just mobbed them to death, basically. Well, this is happening in the digital realm. It was not my phrase. I picked it up from um, Jaron Lanier, who, who coined that term a little while ago, but uh, it's I extend the meaning of it to include... This digital Twitter mobbing, which hadn't happened yet by the time he wrote his essay, I think it became much more common since. So, yeah, you know, there's a chapter in the book called Digital Maoism that deals with all of this. Yeah, and I mean, I wonder if Jordan Peterson might have an insight into the psychology behind it. What makes people act like this? This is not normal behavior. Well, maybe, unfortunately, maybe it is normal behavior in some sense, but it's not. it's not desirable behavior. It's not anything you'd aspire to, and yet... It's everywhere. And I mean, I, I haven't been on this, the receiving end of it to the extent that a lot of people have where it becomes viral. But there are people who just repeat things about me that are clearly false. Yeah. Uh, it, it does not matter what evidence is shown to them. They're going to believe it. And right. I just say, well, you know, I'm just going to block these people. Couldn't care less about them. Yeah. Don't care. They're strangers. I don't care. But if there were a million of them coming after me, that would hurt. Yeah, it gets pretty out of, out of control. Um, I had, you know, tens of thousands at one point. Well, not quite tens of thousands, thousands coming after me at one point. It's not fun at all. But it's interesting how the digital realm makes this much more possible and how it collectivizes people. But I think it's strictly herd mentality is really what it comes down to. And you know, I've written a bit about herd mentality and how it works. Basically, the individual in the herd seeks the herd for security. So the herd is both a threat and a protector at the same time. So if you seek the herd and you abide by the herd's desiderata, if you will, then you're safe. You're safe from attack from the herd. But if you deviate from the herd, the herd, you know, eats you up alive. And that's basically the way social justice is working. It's working in a herd sort of fashion such that those that are, you know, those that go astray like me, you know, are attacked viciously. And uh, the herd mentality is such that it sort of uh, ensures or insulates the, the herd members from being attacked themselves by virtue of attacking. So that's a very curious phenomenon. Do you see any kind of a backlash against this? I mean, I see some backlash, but not strong enough because it's going to have to be a backlash so strong that it can propel new platforms forward. And there are some new platforms, but they haven't really got the traction you'd want them to. No, that, that's because the uh, the main platforms are monopolies almost. I mean, there would be monopolies there attempting to monopolize the field. I would say I, I wouldn't want to see a backlash that's also collectivist like this. So that's why it doesn't work, right? Because basically anybody outside of the left doesn't work in collectives like that. They don't work in mobs. So it's hard to have an anti-mob mob, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it has to be just, uh, you know, clarion calls and examples of individuals standing up to it and defying it. You know, I would say like, <laughs> strangely enough, I would say something like James, uh, D Dave Chappelle 
in his recent uh, comedy uh, series or special not, on on Netflix. Yeah, yeah, special Netflix. Uh, it was great, and he just stood up to them and just said what he wanted, and he defied them. I think people, you know, doing things like that is what's necessary, even if it's in the, an extreme hyperbolic way, which is what I started doing with the anti PC NYU prof Twitter account. I know a lot of people who listen to this program and a lot of people who are my personal friends who are just overwhelmed and are finding it difficult to cope. They've got problems they don't know how to solve. They've got stress they don't know how to deal with. They don't know what the next step is. If that sounds like you, I want you to consider something that up to now you might not have considered. And that is meditation and specifically through the Simple Habit Meditation app. Simple Habit makes it as easy as can be. These are short meditations that can be consumed in five minutes. You can consume them on the go while you're doing chores, and they help you cope with specific problems. You'll find over 100 experts on Simple Habit because it's impossible for one person to have sufficient expertise to help with all problems. That's why Simple Habit is a much better meditation app, and it's no doubt why it has over 65,000 five-star reviews. Hundreds of meditations are available for free and thousands with the premium subscription. Well, go to simplehabit.com slash woods and take 30% off that premium subscription. That's 30% off the premium subscription to Simple Habit when you go to simplehabit.com slash woods. What do you think? I I know that one of the things we want to talk about today is not just the contents of the book uh, per se, but the context of the book, the overall thrust of the book and, and so on. And what I want to know is how are you coming at this differently from the way let's say somebody from the mainstream conservative movement might have written a book about the general subject of social media and forbidden opinions and so on. What's different in the Rechtenwald approach? Well, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's an inside out view because I know what the other side's thinking and I know how they operate and I know their discourse very well. And I use it against them. You'll see that I use Foucault right off the top. I use um, Elsie Zare, who's another Marxist, who wrote an essay about state ideological apparatuses, which I think is actually adoptable for libertarian purposes. I use other leftists, and also I examine the leftist approach to the digital realm, which is total sham. All they're worried about is digital, what they call digital capitalism and exploitation on the web. People that make searches, for example, on Google are being exploited because the information they input or the search that they do, and the clicks that they follow up with are, you know, become Google's uh, information base from which they are able to then sell to advertisers. Okay. So this is supposedly is exploitation because they're unpaid laborers, according to the, uh, what I call the digitalistas, that is the leftist academic studying this field. And they're just throwing up a smoke screen against what's really happening, which is authoritarian leftism. And they can't see it because they're authoritarian leftists themselves. So, the difference between the way I approach this is that I know the academic and I know the inside view. I also know what the leftists are thinking and how they think. And I, I know how to fight them using their tools in some sense, in some cases. You know, maybe as a guy who was on the inside, you can help me understand something. Sure. I think people in the 1960s came to the conclusion that the left wing was idealistic and noble. And a couple of reasons for that were number one, the free speech movement. Right. And number two, the anti-war movement. Right. And these were, and and yet today, uh, it turns out that, I mean, okay, I'll grant you that Bill and Hillary Clinton are not leftists, right? I mean, and leftists would hate Bill and Hillary Clinton. Right. But they did come out of that culture a little bit. Yeah. And when they were in office, they, they didn't mind bombing. That was no problem for them. So it's like, I know there is a web, you know there's the counterpunch website and I know there are people who really are leftist and have have real principles but yet it's vanishingly difficult to find them. Well, I think it's very simple but the question is really leftist with power or leftist without power. Really is what Yeah, I, I was wondering that's what I was getting at. Is that yeah. really what it boils down to? That's really what it boils down to. It's leftists who have power act like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill and Hillary Clinton and Bill Gates as well. Leftists without power act like they're some sort of a beleaguered group who are under attack all the time and they have no power at all, blah, blah, blah. That's part of the ideology of leftism. It has to convince the subject who adopts it 
that they're in the, the camp of the of the uh, you know soon to be extinct or the very vanishing point of reality. They're always uh, under siege. Blah blah blah. They're they're besieged. They're beleaguered. They're weak. Meanwhile, their ideology is dominating most of the world. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah, I know it. I know how you could feel that way when every major institution echoes you and people are terrified to dissent from you. I mean, if the left were enduring what regular people are enduring right now, we would never, ever hear the end of it. Right, of, of, oh my gosh, like an award show is just going to be a lecture to all of us <laughs> and, and we can't even watch it. And it's, I mean, they would not be able to tolerate this for one second. Exactly. I mean, that's the thing though, that there's, like I sort of break it down in this, this fictional chapter. I don't know if you read that or not. I have a fictional chapter in which I describe political ideology in terms of computer code. Yeah. Basically, there is a piece of code in the leftist ideology that says you are an underdog. No matter what, you are an underdog. So they have to, they believe this underdog status. You know, I, I know this from the inside. I thought so too. I thought I have no chance to really make any money because blah, blah, blah. It's a static class system. There's the ruling class, blah, blah, blah. I'm in the working class, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, I have to collectivize with these other people in order to get any power, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just part of the code. It's, it's absolutely ingested by the, by the leftist believer. And once they ingest it, there's really no way around it. It's part of intrinsically bound with the rest of the belief system. I wonder if it has something to do with this. I'm not saying that everybody on the left is a Marxist, but I think there are ways in which they do think like – maybe Leninists, because of yeah. course it's attributed to Lenin, the whole who whom thing, who will overtake whom. Right. And that mentality is, is not one of peaceful coexistence, that if we can reach a mutual understanding, we can live side by side. It's one side is going to crush the other. And if you don't want to be crushed, you better do the crushing. Absolutely. That seems to me the way they operate. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've thought about this quite a bit. I think, I used to think that the goal of leftism was, you know, their noble ideals and abstractions. And that collectivism was just the means of getting to the end. Now I'm starting to think that collectivism is actually the end, not the means, but the thing that they're trying to get. Why? Because they believe they're weak. They believe they're poor. They believe they're disenfranchised. They believe they're, you know, uh, subordinated, blah, 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 excluded or marginalized, you know, all the terms, all the marked terms of being left out, put down, strung along, blah, 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 everything else, I think. This is really, collectivism is really the object, uh, in, in a sense, because this is a group who, who believes that, that they don't have any, any individual power at all, that they have no individual agency that has any meaning. See, the leftists are really all about systemic reality. They can't do anything to the system. It's too big. It's too powerful. I can't overcome it. I got to collect with other people because of, Without them, I can't do anything. So what if it's just a herd mentality that is meant to make, maintain the herd, in effect, rather than the noble abstractions? This would explain why, in fact, when they gain power, they kill every, you know, so many people because, and imprison so many others. Because it's not really the noble abstractions that are the end of it all. The collectivism is the end. Oh, man. Wow. That just blew my mind. <laughs> I haven't said that in a long time. Well, uh, good. I want to. I want to know what you're going to be talking about. Uh, at the end of this month, they're having the Libertarian Scholars Conference in New York City, and you are speaking there. Yeah. And I'd like to know what you're going to address. I hope it's this stuff. Oh, it is. It, it, it's mostly since this is a Libertarian Scholars Conference. It's an academic conference, so I'm going to approach the academics with this issue that with what I'm calling Google Marxism. And that is the internet ideology and the academics who perpetuate it. And my point here is that I'm going to study these. I'm going to talk about the digitalistas, what they're up to, how they're obscuring a real earnest study of what's going on, how they're obscuring the, the actual orientation of the web and what it's tending towards and everything else by virtue of this nonsense about digital capitalism and exploitation. And then... I talk about this this way that they make this digital hive mind and the digital hives hive minds and how they operate. We were talking about that just a minute ago about the collectivism, and then I talk about white the corporate leftism that's a sort of abiding ideology and infrastructure of 
of Google, of, of the whole Google archipelago or what I also call big digital, how they're, they're really corporate leftists, corporate uh, leftists, and you might even say corporate socialists. And that sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not uh, because what is socialism? It's not monopolization. That's what it is. It's monopoly. Monopoly over the means of production. Well, these corporations want monopolies over their means of production, whatever they may be. And then everybody else sort of actually existing socialism on the ground. It's, it's very much like what happened in the Soviet Union. You have the upper elite who are claiming, you know, they're doing everything for mankind or the working class in particular, who are living you know, lavish lives while everybody else is in the subsistence mode. That's basically their objective. So I get into all that. And it's kind of dour, so I end with a joke, just like I end the book with a joke, more or less. I assume you're not going to reveal that to us. You have to be at the <laughs> not conference. Not right now, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so... Um, I think you know what it is, yeah. Yes, indeed. Now, people uh, who are interested in that conference, by the way, the details they can find at the Mises Institute website, mises.org slash events. They can find the details. Um, there, I assume there's still spots if you'd like to attend that in New York City. The book we've been talking about is Google Archipelago, The Digital Gulag and the Simulation of Freedom. I'm going to have a link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1497, our show notes page for today. And Michael Rechtenwald, you continue to make people think about important things, and we appreciate the fact that you've kept such an open mind. I, I Thank you. Honestly, I'm not sure I could do what, what you're doing. I, if, if I came to the end of my life and decided that I'd been really – wrong about a major thing. I think I'd just retire to a monastery and Tom, you know, you, live you, out in silence you, the rest of my life. <laughs> you sound like you're trying to put me in the grave here, buddy. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm, only, I'm sorry. I'm not that old. <laughs> okay. But, but, but honestly, but, but my point is that this type of, of you know, radical shift in the way somebody thinks happens when sure. you're in your teens and 20s. You know? Yeah, sure. I understand. Uh, yeah. You and I don't do things like this, which right. is what makes it so interesting for us. Strangely enough, I was a, I was a communist from early age, you know, because I think that this stuff was being subtly infiltrating into the culture. Uh, you know, I think McCarthy just underestimated the, the means of uh, communist perp- uh, ideological uh, indoctrination. Uh, I mean, I don't know how the, does a 15-year-old kid in the north side of Pittsburgh who has no special access to anything comes out communist. I mean, where is this coming from? Yeah, yeah. Great question. I mean, I remember arguments with my father about this. You know, he was an independent contractor. He worked with, you know, very, 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 you know, rugged individualist and all that. And actually, I, I admire it now. Then I was really like constantly butting heads with the poor guy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, God rest his soul. He, you know, he he shot back at me. Good stuff. You know, like when you refer, to, you would refer to the Soviet Union. I thought as a writer, yeah, I might prefer it because at least I'd have a living. You know, and I thought. Uh, you know, not realizing that I might have been killed or put in a gulag, you know. Yeah. It's just a lack of information, but just how the heck does a teenage boy in America, you know, basically the near Midwest, end up with communist ideals? It has to be coming from somewhere. It wasn't generated out of my own head. So I think the media was actually, I don't want to get into conspiracies and stuff, but I think there's there was, you know, I, I pointed this out in my, my last talk this is, for example, the show Gilligan's Island in the 60s was basically a communist Robinson Crusoe tale. I mean, so there there was a lot of stuff going on like that, I think, that, uh, that helped, you know, circulate or diffuse socialism and communist ideals uh, to the public. Well, I managed to evade all that stuff. Good I was too you. clueless and f- focused on other things at the time. Yeah. But I can see it. I mean, you're right. There are ways that people might imbibe these things without an open lecture about Marxian economics or something. Yeah, that's right. right. That's I mean, the they, they got in the 60s, they basically was all, the whole thing about anti-communism was, oh, it's all McCarthyism and it was given a really smear. It was given a really bad name to be anti-communist. And so it became almost a joke. It became like a, position for hacks or idiots or, you know, people that were like, uh, you know, just sort of fun. They weren't with it. They were, they were not uh, on cue. They just didn't get the point that McCarthyism was a complete hyperbolic, you know, uh, idiocy. And meanwhile, it was probably an underestimation in, or in some sense, it was just in the wrong register dealing with the wrong issues. You, you know, it wasn't about membership in the party. It was the way the ideology was pervading the entire culture. 
Right, right. Yeah, that's the thing that matters. Yeah. That, that is indeed the thing that matters. Yeah. So, all right, uh, Google Archipelago is the book linked at tomwoods.com slash 1497. I wish I could be at that conference. I have something else uh, going on. I was hoping to meet you finally. I know. This is going to happen one of these days. I, I, am, I, I assure so. you. I hope so, Tom. <laughs> But they got to run these dates by. Me. I want to show you that I don't have any gray hair, and I'm not ready to jump into the tomb. <laughs> no, well, look, I mean, but you understand my point I, I get there. Your I'm point, not yeah. to, no worries. because no because worries. It, according to my point, I'm an oldster too. I mean, no, <laughs> yeah. Nobody who's 47. I know you says, don't you yeah. see people changing their political beliefs at 56 years old. No, right? Which I was no. when I did. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's great, and we we absolutely love you for that, and uh, and my listeners are are huge fans of yours. So uh, oh, so again, that very much. I appreciate the good work, and and I'll look forward to hearing what you had to say uh, at the conference. Thanks again. Thanks, Tom. All right, thanks everybody for listening. That's another week of episodes in the can, so to speak. So we'll see you all next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just thirty minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.